The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Christopher Jensen from Franklin Templeton Digital Assets. We speak about Franklin Templeton's approach to the digital asset space, emphasizing their fundamentals-focused approach to research and internal analysis to understand protocols, tokens, and value accrual. Our conversation also touches on client demand, institutional interest, and the creation of a comprehensive product suite to cater to varying levels of investor demand and knowledge. Christopher highlights the importance of on-chain data, the use of blockchain technology for operational efficiencies, and the ongoing exploration of new crypto use cases like decentralized physical infrastructure networks. Additionally, we speak about Franklin Templeton's pioneering efforts in launching the first tokenized money market fund on chain and their plans for the future on this front. Tune in to learn about how Franklin Templeton is navigating and contributing to the on chain future. All of a sudden, about a week ago, we had this, I'd say, like a very sudden shift in climate in terms of policy towards ETH. We had the 19B4 forms all of a sudden got approved. And, and as I know that you and Franklin Templeton, have a uh, spot Ethereum ETF application kind of uh, pending approval. I was wondering how you view the events over the past two weeks. Um, did, did anything out there catch you off guard or, or are things moving forward as expected? Yeah, I think a hundred percent it caught us off guard as I think it did for most of the industry. We had, you know, kind of revised our expectations of low to non-existent for, for May. And, and we were worried, I think, you know, and I don't think it was an unconsensus view. I mean, we were worried about, you know, all of 2024. And so it was, it was surprising to us as well. I think it's interesting to think about and, you know, kind of peel back the onion as to the, the drivers of it and as well as the downstream kind of ramifications of kind of what it all means. And what's exciting is it, it seems to be quite significant, not just for ETH and Ethereum, but for you know, really the industry at large. Um, and it, it is, as you mentioned, kind of all happening, you know, real time. It's pretty exciting. I feel like every, every day, you know, you, you get a little bit more color, but you know, um, we hadn't heard anything and, and all of a sudden, you know, now, I mean, as you're seeing with, you know, with all the applications and, and amended S ones coming out, all of a sudden there's engagement, right. And there's, there's progress and, and, and obviously the the actual improvement of those, those, uh, 19 before. So we're, you know, we finally moved in the right direction, but I think it, it caught us off guard, but I think it, it caught the whole industry off guard. Yeah, definitely a big step in the right direction for the whole industry. And I can only imagine that that has kept you pretty busy over the past two weeks with, with this sudden shift in climate. So I do really appreciate you joining the podcast. So Christopher, welcome to the fundamentals pod. I'm excited to dive into everything around such a prominent asset manager like Bramble Temple and what you guys are doing in the digital asset space and how you're thinking about things. Thanks. It's a, a pleasure to be here and, and speak with you, at, you know, as I was on my own kind of personal crypto journey. Um, you, know, you guys have been around since the beginning, right? So I've been reading your research on your dashboard, you know, I feel like since the beginning. So uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and speak with you. Awesome. Uh, glad to hear that. Now, I think a good place to start maybe here would be that as you kind of had research operations over at Franklin Templeton Digital Assets, could you maybe speak a little bit about what your main focus areas over at that team are as of today? Sure. So you know, my, my official title is, is Director of Research for, for Franklin Digital Assets. And sometimes people think that's, you know, the focus is on external research, but we do a little bit of that. We also have a lot of kind of thought leadership teams trying to, you know, put out content and because education is such an important part of, of this industry, cause it's nascent, right. And getting people comfortable with how the asset class works. It's very, very new, but you know, my primary responsibilities are more on the internal research side, you know, the, the investment team that is charged with kind of understanding these protocols, these tokens how value accrual works, where does it flow to, and ultimately what they're worth. So, you know, my background is really in, in kind of alternatives, esoteric asset classes, a lot of private credit. And so it's really with that lens of, you know, information isn't always clean or easy to access, but somehow you have to find it and do something with it, make sense of it, not get kind of caught up in narratives, but actually, you know, ultimately we're trying to find attractively priced risk. And so 
you know, kind of the team, the process, everything is designed to, to do that. And, and I guess the way we've set it up is very similar to how I've done this in other asset classes. I think it's a little bit more deal focused rather than market focused. So what I mean by that is, you know, we're not, we're not a big trading high frequency, you know, turnover shop. It's much more, let's take our time to really understand, you know, how these protocols work, have a thesis. Ideally, we're looking for something with a strong fundamental underpinning, some catalysts on the horizon. We do go through the exercise of kind of setting up, you know, price targets and conviction levels, kind of all of that. But, but we don't expect it to hit, hit that, you know, in the next 24 hours, 48, right? It's not a quick trade or a, a momentum thing. We do have kind of momentum strategies, but really what the research team, you know, on the digital asset side of Franklin is doing is trying to take that more kind of long, longer term, you know, for, for crypto fundamental approach to figuring out how these protocols and tokens work and where value flows and kind of what makes sense in terms of where that token and the market cap should be priced at. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love to hear the word fundamental when you're speaking about your approach to this space. And uh, you definitely picked the right one. I uh, might be a bit biased in saying that, but, but that's great to hear. And one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is what, what the current state of kind of institutional interest towards this asset class in general, and especially like client interest. And I think a question building on that that I have in my mind is that as you put together like this digital assets team, how much of your strategy and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis have been shaped by client demand, like existing client demand, or how much of it is more proactive getting things ready for when that demand starts to come in? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, client demand really is so multifaceted, right? Because, you know, Franklin, broadly speaking, sells into retail channels and, and in the digital asset space, obviously we're, we're one of the ETF providers. So that's a, it's kind of a very easy product that is being bought, not just by retail, but also by institutions. So we're catering to retail clients, but we're also catering to institutional demand. And even there it's multifaceted because, you know, a, a family offices appetite for risk assets, broadly speaking for crypto in particular, uh, might vary quite a bit. Their education on the space, their knowledge of the space might vary quite a bit. And this, this also varies across the world. So we're a global, you know, asset manager with investors in over 175 different countries. And it's quite, you know, kind of, yeah, multidimensional, as I said, pensions and SWIFTs and, you know, at the institutions of private banks, asset managers, we're kind of talking to all these different types of clients and their needs, their education level, their appetite really varies across the spectrum. So as, you know, to your question, as we think about based on that demand and that kind of varied demand, how do we think about rolling out a, pro a product suite for this new industry? We're trying to go about it by having kind of a comprehensive product suite, right? That involves multiple ways to access digital asset crypto exposure, whether someone's just looking for beta exposure to the asset class, or they're looking for something that, you know, is generating alpha. But on the, on the kind of market beta side, that might be the ETFs, that might be a, a crypto index fund type of product, maybe structured as an SMA, a separately managed account, something like that. Or, and if they're looking for alpha in, in the space, you know, that comes into maybe that's venture, or maybe that is a best idea, you know, token fund. So that's generally how we think about it. What products deliver market beta to this new asset class and this new kind of transformational technology? what products deliver kind of alpha exposure to this asset class? The variance in people's knowledge level, that's tough to cater to. So <laughs> you have a challenge, a challenge in front of you there, especially because, you know, even with a lot of crypto native people, we still don't have clear standards or clear understanding of how we should be thinking about these things. So definitely harder to fish the people who are more used to traditional assets. But on that product suite that you're putting together, of course, one of the biggest products there for sure is the uh, Bitcoin ETF. It's been on the market for some time now. I was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit about the traction that your digital asset products have gotten and like, especially the Bitcoin ETF now. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, for Franklin, it's certainly been successful in terms, you know, relative to the, you know, other ETFs that we've, we've launched. I think we've been happy with the asset the AUM gathering at this point, and, and obviously there's some, some big leaders in this, in, in the space who are, you know, really kind of propelling flows and hats off to them, I think. So we look at kind of what the 
what the Franklin one's doing, but also really what the ETF complex is doing. And as a whole, you know, democratizing the asset class, providing that new door, that new front door, you know, for for retail and institutions to walk through to access Bitcoin and then more broadly speaking, digital assets. It's huge. And the regulatory stamp of approval with having an approved ETF, I think is very important to be able to see that ETF next to your stocks and bonds, you know, in your kind of traditional portfolio, you know, I think is quite huge. And so, you know, I think in general, it's, it's been extremely successful, right? As a product and as a way of accessing this asset class. And I think actually because of Bitcoin success, right? That's part of the reason we're seeing, you know, uh, Ethereum kind of potentially follow in its foot does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And from your point of view, what would you say are the biggest barriers to adoption of this asset class as of today? Yeah, I think the the largest one has been, you know, education. I think it's to the point where it's hard to not have an opinion. And it's almost like you, you can't get by without having an opinion. And so to have an, an informed opinion, you have to do work. You have to, to understand it. You can, to just ignore it right, is actually an active decision now. And it's one that, you know, I think investors are, are wondering, well, why? If, if you're choosing not to invest in it or have it on your platform, you know, kind of why? And they need a, a logical, reasonable, defensible yeah, reason to support that view. And so, you know, whether people are actively buying it or they're going through this educational process, I just think it's, you know, and with institutions, it takes time, as we know. So I think you know, seeing things like SWIB, right? The Wisconsin Investment Board, the pension there, you know, in its 13F released dis disclosures around, you know, quite a substantial amount of Bitcoin ETF holding. And, you know, and they're a very innovative allocator in the space, right? So it's pretty impressive that already in the first quarter, they've gotten there. And what I think we're seeing is many, many more institutions are in this process, in this journey of educating themselves now. They might not you know, ultimately get there, but to, you know, to my original point, they have to have a view now. And so, you know, I think a lot of folks in the industry are talking about the role that all, all of us can play, right. in kind of educating folks in the space as they get up to speed, you know, as, as, as you mentioned, it can be quite technical, but really distilling, you know, the value proposition of what do these protocols do? What is, what does Bitcoin do? Or what does Ethereum do? How are they different? And then once you get past that part, it's. Really, the question is, is for a diversified portfolio, how does an investment in Bitcoin or an investment in Ethereum or any of these digital assets, what's the role of crypto and digital assets in a diversified portfolio? And so you get kind of the crypto domain expertise, but then also the portfolio construction exercise of looking at, you know, risk and return and correlation and, you know, how do you kind of put it all together into a portfolio? Yeah. For sure. And I'll say that you guys have definitely done the work to build an opinion. And as a reader and consumer of your content and the research you put out, it's great to see. And I, I do quite like your approach and the way that you're thinking of things. So I was wondering if we could maybe move on to speak a little bit about the details of how you are breaking these assets down as investable assets and then kind of pitching those to clients or educating your clients through that. And if you look at a lot of the research um, that you do write, one term that comes up quite often is the protocol economy. So could you briefly explain the concept of the protocol economy and how it differs from kind of the bucket outside of that? Yeah, definitely. So if we think about, you know, one of the value propositions of, of crypto distributed ledger technology is that it decreased the cost of trust and you can kind of strip out intermediaries. That's certainly one component. And so, you know, that manifests itself into certain things being cheaper and, and not 10% cheaper, but you can get orders of magnitude cheaper and more efficient and that sort of thing. And then you get into the aspect of, well, it's also, you know, kind of this idea of programmable money and that can unlock new use cases. And so this combination of increased functionality with decreased cost, I think is is what opens up the design space and really opens up the value proposition of what crypto can bring to the table in a variety of use cases. And on the, you know, decreasing the, the cost of trust, stripping out intermediaries, what enables that are, are protocols. So instead of in the platform economy, you know, to get 
exposure to a big web two, you know, technology or, or player, you know, we don't stock in a, in a company of a platform that maybe is creating a marketplace that's bringing together the demand side and supply side and, and extracting the take rate. And that flows through many steps and hopefully, you know, accrues value to, you know, if I'm, if I'm a stock and equity holder, you know, the stock, or if I'm a bond holder, you know, the bond. And so here it's a much more direct relationship. And this is all kind of, you know, an extension of what Chris Dixon, right. And it's read, write, own, and, and just kind of web two to web three, the idea of now you can actually partake, participate in the ownership of these protocols of these platforms. And that ownership is much more direct. So, you know, I can, yeah, literally be a consumer, a user of the protocol, and at the same time, be an owner of the protocol. And there's nothing really in between. And I think when you extract out, you know, those kind of intermediaries and have that more direct ownership, it aligns incentives better. I'm, I'm more inclined to promote a certain product or service that I like when I, when I own it directly, when I'm consuming it. And that experience is much more direct. That's completely true. And then building on that from like an investor's perspective, how are you communicating the main difference between holding a token versus holding a traditional equity from like a portfolio construction point of view, given what you just laid out there? Yeah. And I think this comes down to the concept of value accrual, right? And so one of the things that we try to do is assess product market fit. You know, why does this protocol have a defensible, reasonable a reason to exist? And then, you know, it gets into like the tokenomic design of the protocol and how value that the protocol creates, how it actually flows back to the token. And so I think both are super important. And one thing that we've actually appreciated more over time, I think initially we came out with that kind of stratify, really wanting the, really wanting the value accrual and kind of putting tokenomic design almost at the top. And I think while it's extremely important, I think, you know, obviously uh, product market fit has to be at the top. And so, but we, we really could look at these two in, in tandem product market fit and, and, you know, kind of a strong tokenomic design. If you're investing in token, these are, these are absolutely crucial. Right. And so as we're assessing these, you know, how do we think about value accrual? Well, you know, if, if a protocol is generating value, it should be, you know, if, if anything is generating value, people are willing to pay for it. And so somehow there's some kind of top line concept of fees or revenues, you know, and this is what you guys do a great job at kind of parsing out from the, the on-chain data. Right. But it's one thing to generate the fees, but then another to well, where do they go? And so one of the old adages is follow the money. And this gets into the idea of, well, what does a, a P and L statement versus a cash flow statement look like in the on-chain world? And you generate these fees at the top line and then kind of tracing it through and who, who ultimately benefits from it. Right. And, and you have to pay out your supply side. That's kind of akin to cost of goods sold, but ultimately there's money left over or hopefully there's money left over, you know, kind of where does that go? And, you know, unlike in traditional finance where you have legal contracts that kind of govern some of the, where does value flow and accrue in token land, you really have just software, right? There aren't really legal contracts, but there's software. There's the, the tokenomic design of the protocol that you can, you know, kind of analyze and get some comfort around where value will flow. And so it's a little bit different, but it's that same concept as traditional finance. It's just, you know, we're relying on how the protocol is programmed and the software rather than on say a legal document governing my kind of rights as, as an equity holder, as a bond holder or something like that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad you brought up value accrual because that is kind of the perspective that we look at things from as well. And I wanted to ask building on that because you have some great takes in your research as well around specific metrics that combine different on-chain components to, to assess like value accrual. What kind of new metrics or methods have you developed at, at Franklin to kind of better understand and evaluate these digital assets in addition to just like the basic price to sales, price to fees ratios, which might not tell the whole story. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of it is borrowed from, you know, traditional finance. And, and when I say kind of trap, I am really, we're, we're trying to use the best tools in a variety of disciplines. So literally we look to, and, and thankfully, you know, our team has, has experience in a variety of disciplines. So we'll look to, you know, how, how do venture capitalists do it with kind of web two, you know, tech companies. 
we look at, so, you know, everything kind of traditional equity land, fixed income land and, and credit, you know, SaaS finance, as well as what can we learn from kind of commodity analysis and currency analysis. And, you know, so with these best practices that have kind of been proven out, you can't apply them one for one to digital assets because it's a, a new space, right? But, but what you can do is kind of adapt them. And so I'll give you some examples. One is we, we actually are in the camp that think, you know, DCF is a useful tool. Uh, so all of these are imperfect, right? What you're trying to do is, is triangulate on a source of value. And this is what you do in, you know, pick your asset class. So it's no different from digital assets. So we're trying to use a variety of tools to triangulate around a source of value. And the primary reason we use DCF, which is, you know, historically thought as an intrinsic valuation tool, is actually we use it more for as a relative valuation tool. So if we use a similar DCF framework, for protocols in a similar sector, we can actually use that as a basis of comparison between the two. And that actually sometimes is more insightful than just the intrinsic kind of valuation of the protocol if you were just to look at it in, in isolation. So that's that's one example where we take a, a common tool from TradFi and we apply it and really use it more as a relative valuation tool in digital assets. Another one, a classic example is a, a payback analysis. And so we've kind of adapted that into this thing we call the years to profitability analysis, which looks at kind of smart contract platforms and, and sets up a framework for, say you give it a certain amount of growth assumptions kind of across the board, given the tokenomic design of the protocol, how long would it take for that, that smart contract blockchain to achieve profitability given the knowns, which are say your distribution of supply how the actual mechanics work of, of say burn in, in addition to a growth rate or really a growth rate spectrum that you apply to it. And so again, if you do that across, you get, you get a sense of which ones have a clear path to profitability. Another way, a thing that you can do is look at kind of a return on capital unit economic basis and, you know, kind of segment things into cohorts or static pools as you kind of alluded to. I think you use the word sustainable, you know, kind of economic engine. And I think that's one of the most important things here in digital assets, because obviously a lot of these protocols have to get the flywheel going. And so they're spending, you know, their currency token emission to drive growth to the platform to get that, you know, flywheel going. But, you know, how much new users, how much new capital, how much new economic activity is generated off of that spend, you can apply that kind of framework to digital assets. And I think you could through the use of using some of the data and tools that like on your platform, actually look at the return on capital spent by a cohort of users. And then you have to kind of do the, the next step of, you know, how sticky is it? Cause it's one thing to, you know, use say a point system or a bunch of just token emissions and incentives to drive a whole bunch of growth. And then, you know, as soon as that turns off, it all goes away. And so I think, you know, that that's another type of, of analysis that's very common as you look at SaaS companies and kind of web two, you can kind of apply that to protocols in, in web three. That's fantastic. You, you touched on a lot of really important topics that, that we are definitely aligned on like blockchain sustainability and assessing the sustainability of these projects that as of today are comparable to like very early stage startups. You need to think of them in a way that what path are they on? And you can't necessarily take metrics at face value as of today and compare them to more traditional equities that are much more mature because you just have early stage companies operating in a public environment on chain. So valuation multiples might look crazy from time to time. So I'm glad to hear that you're also working with metrics like years of profitability and such, which add a lot of context to uh, understanding what's actually going on there. In, in terms of sustainability, I wanted to ask because this, this has been a topic that has got a lot of attention, both in us posting about it on Twitter from the crypto native community, but also from more traditional investors looking from the outside in and assessing sustainability, because it is somewhat of a novel concept that you're just spending, it's kind of basically stock-based compensation for your users and, and I'll, like to use an analogy, taking your currency and using that to spend it as a customer acquisition cost to get people to use your platform. How do you define a sustainable blockchain? It's also tricky because a related question is how do you think about, you know, kind of competitive modes in web three, when it's all open source co code that can be forked. And as I mentioned, you know, we used to really kind of prioritize tokenomics and, and, and now, you know, I think it's still extremely important, but 
demonstrating real product market fit and sustainability is is paramount. And so, you know, how do you do that? You know, the, the only real kind of net boat in crypto are network effects, right? And so that should be evident in, you know, retention of users and, you know, kind of economic activity on the chain or protocol, despite or kind of independent to some as much as possible, the amount of emissions or capital or incentives that you're using to fund that growth. So I think it should show up there in, in terms of re retention and, and those types of metrics. I think also the user experience is incredibly important as well. And, you know, just like back when I, so I was kind of an industry journalist, covered, you know, a, lo a lot of different sectors and industries, one of them being retail and, you know, to, to understand the space, you have to go to the store and you have to walk the aisles and look at product placement on the shelves and. You know, talk to employees, talk to customers. And in many ways, what we're doing here in kind of web three is, is the exact same. So we have to, we have to use the products. We have to go experience it. We have to talk to developers, talk to customers. It's all the same. It's all the same things in a completely different industry and asset class. But in doing so, you realize that certain user experiences are a lot better than others. And I think that's where like these, these points, you know, schemes can be useful because it does attract users to come use your protocol. And, and yes, they might be doing it because they're looking to get an airdrop or farm points or whatever, but it does get them to use your product and that user experience will vary. Right. So, I mean, just to, you know, use an example, I think, you know, those who go say use and trade on Jupiter and, you know, and they see what, what an amazing experience that's, that's going to contrast it with say an experience that they've had on other decks or other decks aggregators. You know, that's, that's important because maybe they're just trying to do it for the airdrop, but they, they used it and they're like, that's pretty fast and cheap and, and seamless. And, and they're more inclined to use it again. And so that's what we're really looking for. A good user experience that makes sense because that's, what's going to make people come back when the incentives go away. Yep. And I, I can vouch to that because I mean, personally, like with perp dexes, those are some projects that I've been farming a lot of airdrops with and I've become a sticky user just purely due to starting off by farming an airdrop and noticing that damn this is actually pretty good and that happens a lot and also just transferred assets to new ecosystems because of that and stayed there and the data doesn't lie i mean with cohort analysis and other like civil type of filters you're able to slowly start to get a real picture of what the actual organic usage is and then start slowly assessing the actual sustainability of the activity on the blockchain so definitely on, on the right track there I was thinking we can maybe move to speak a bit more specifically about how you utilize on-chain data in your research and analysis, because it is a paradigm shift to traditional company data. First off, just the, the amount of data that is available in real time comes with a lot of issues and the lack of standardization presents its own challenges as well. But from your point of view, when you're assessing these projects, do you speak a bit about the pros and cons that on-chain data introduces compared to like traditional company data? Yeah, definitely. You know, I would say I, I get asked a lot, you know, kind of what's the essence of your process? And the answer on the surface is the exact same as it is with other asset classes, or at least how I've, I've kind of invested in other asset classes, which is it's all about data analysis and kind of diligence calls. Now the, the, the problem or the difference with crypto is, is how you do both of those things is, is, is fundamentally different. So on the data analysis side, to your point, it's not like I can go open up a 10 Q or a 10 K and just, it, it's all right there, and, you, know, you know, here, and, and I'm obviously simplifying out, you know, try to find us use, use a lot more than just, you know, public filing, but you, you, you get the sense. Here it's what information is important, where to get it. And cause a lot of times you'll get a team creating say a dashboard on Dune or, or some of these other sites. And, you know, that's akin to management putting forth their, their own model and their own sets of projections, which, you know, you ingest and consume along with little pieces of data, but you always want to get as close to the source as possible and, and Trapify, you, you know, these would be data rooms and whatnot here, it's all on chain but it needs to be cleansed and tagged and understood in a certain way. Right. And, and that's where it gets challenging. I think, you know, here at Franklin Templeton, 
one of the reasons we started up a node operations business was to kind of be close to all this on-chain data. And today we run nodes on, I think double digit, I want to say a dozen, but you know, certainly double digit number of chain. And it's really to be close to the data. Now, but what we found though is, is it's one thing to have all that primary source of data, which is usually what you want, you know, investing in any class, asset class, you want to be close to the primary source of data, but to, you know, cleanse it, to tag it, to know what to do with it is, is actually very tricky and, that, and it's not standardized, right? As you know, it, it's quite different across these chains and ecosystems. So, you know, I think we've kind of evolved to really relying and using kind of the trusted data providers in this space to help do that piece of it for us to kind of parse, you know, cleanse, tag the data so that we can just focus on analyzing it. So I think, you know, to your question, that's a big step is, is kind of where to get it and how to get it into a format where that you can trust. And then in terms of analyzing it, one of the nice things, you know, you know pros and cons, but one of the nice things is that it's, it's real time. So, you know, we can actually construct financial models that pull in, you know, kind of real time data and, and can update models on the fly or they can update, say a comps dashboard on the fly. This is fantastic. I mean, this, this can't be done in, in TradFi land. And so literally we can press refresh and I can have, you know, last three months, if I'm, you know, running this kind of toggle or switch my model, last three months, annualize, have that flow into my forward projections, or I could look at LTM and it would be as of financials that are as current as up to yesterday. And so that, that's an extremely important kind of value add to working in this asset class, but you know, to get to that point, right. It took a lot of, as you know, it took a lot of kind of cleansing of and parsing of the data such that analysts like myself can then kind of pull up real time into these models. Oh yeah. And it's still a very open design space in terms of standardization. I mean, we're doing our best to push these new standards forward and get people to adopt them and then showcase line items that can be relatively compared to each other, but, but there's a lot to do and there's a lot more data that still needs to be parsed. But I think you having the node operations at Franklin is like a really interesting approach. And I'm sure you've learned a lot through that process, uh, which one of the learnings, which you said that I think a lot of players have, have bumped into is the fact that running the full data pipeline, owning and managing it, like the full stack one to get from the raw data to the standardized metrics, cleaning, parsing, tagging is a pretty tough one. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you're able to find value from uh, data providers like us as well, who, who do that job. But in terms of having access to the primary data, when you do run those nodes, I wanted to ask whether you have seen a clear strategic advantage in doing that. Have you been able to directly generate more alpha from having the primary access to data or does it come with maybe more challenges than it does with, with alpha? Yeah, it's, there's certainly some insights that come from it. I think e even little things like knowing just what it takes to process, store, work with, in some cases, you know, very uh, voluminous <laughs> records of, of, of data, right? And so in addition to running nodes, I mean, having like in-house blockchain engineers, right? When, when I think about Franklin digital assets, broadly speaking, it, it basically falls into two camps. You know, we're, we're builders in this space and we're investors in the space. And so because we also have the building arm, you know, we have in-house um, blockchain engineers, in addition to kind of node operators and, and that sort of thing. So for me as an, an investment kind of principle, you know, being able to have, pick up the phone, you know, I mentioned it's data analysis and diligence calls. Well, you know, I can, I can reach out to a blockchain engineer in-house to kind of run an idea or, Hey, you know, well, when, when you're thinking about break even validator economics on this chain, you know, what are we actually seeing by running our own node? Right. And I think that's, it's very important for understanding in each of these ecosystems, there's a variety of stakeholders and you have to understand the value proposition for each of the stakeholders in an ecosystem. So there are the, you know, consumers engaging with decentralized applications on a, on a smart contract platform. There are the protocols themselves developing, you know, the developers developing, you know, apps, but then there's in a proof of stake network, you have validators validating transactions and participating in a consensus. So you have all these different stakeholders and you have to realize that they all have different incentives and the value proposition to each of them, it kind of needs to work for the whole ecosystem as a whole to be healthy. And so 
having one of those constituents, one of those stakeholders kind of in-house, I think is valuable to understand that part of the equation. And then obviously, you know, we can go as a, you know, using my retail example, we can go engage with the product. We can talk to other customers. We can understand it from that perspective. And then talking to, you know, in-house people that develop on these ecosystems, that's a different perspective. You know, what's it like to, you know, work with those libraries or, you know, develop code there or deal with congestion or that sort of thing. So it's a variety of perspectives that all kind of help fill in the picture of, of what's being created. Is it real? Is it sustainable? Is it valuable? And then we get into what's it worth. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, as you have breadth of experience investing across asset classes, and now as you've been working more and more with on-chain data, do you see on-chain data in some way changing traditional accounting standards in the near future? Yeah, I think it's going to play a role. Right? I mean, I think, you know, just zooming out for a second, I mean, you know, digital assets and kind of on-chain assets and off-chain traditional asset world, right? These, these things are, are coming together. You're obviously hearing talks about your stock exchange, others, you know, how, how can they trade digital assets? I think it doesn't take too much imagination to look forward and see, you know, kind of all of these things trade and coexist together. And so when we think about accounting standards evolving, I mean, one of the problems with in TradFi is, you know, we're it, it's stale by the time, you know, filings come out, you know, we're in best case scenario, I mean, it's usually like 45 days after quarter end, you know, I did a lot on the private side, so I would get, you know, monthly financials, but I never got weekly financials. At least I don't think so. Usually it was monthly, which is still a lot better than quarterly, but here to get it daily and to get it real time, I think is incredibly important. And I think one of the interesting examples that you've seen is the on-chain community, you know, will construct with their view of say Coinbase's financials and, and, and earnings. And they'll have a view that a lot of times quite different than the view that, you know, Wall Street will take, right? By just kind of using their information sources. And usually the crypto view of kind of where a public entity like Coinbase is going to come out in terms of earnings and, and whatnot, or actually, I think, you know, from what I've looked, it, more accurate when the, when the crypto people are, are doing the analysis because their data is just a lot richer and, and it's refreshed on a, a higher frequency basis than the data that, you know, kind of the TradFi analysts are working with. Oh yeah. And, and there's that, that's a topic that I've been speaking about in a lot of places and was speaking on the Bloomberg webinar earlier this year about the fact how massive of an edge analyzing on-chain data really brings traditional equity analysts right now, as you have these fintech incumbents launching on-chain business lines, then, I mean, the estimates become more precise and that's going to kind of end up in you know, more accurate price discovery for assets in the long run, as we have more and more operations going on chain, because you don't need to have to have to wait three months for earnings reports and stuff. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. But one thing that is really impressive and that I'd like to follow with how you and Franklin have approached the digital asset space is that you've been quite early in pioneering a lot of concepts of which one was introducing like the first tokenized security to run on a blockchain. You did that way before that was really talked about too much, or it was a hype thing as it is now becoming more and more, more of. So could you share some insights from that experience and what got you to experiment with that? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for bringing it up. Cause that's one of, so we first got started by running a node on a blockchain with a web two founder that we had kind of known from our FinTech days. And, and one of the things when you're, you know, running a node and, and staking a position and you're earning tokens, all of a sudden they're on your balance sheet. What do you do with them? How do you value them? So that, that's how we initially got started, but it didn't take very long for us to think of, it's kind of see where the puck was going. Right. And, and this idea, this theme of tokenization, probably going to be something that had legs to it. And, and this is in 2018, 19, you know, to your point. And so realizing that there was a decent chance that the world would kind of move in this direction we decided to start kind of playing around with it and building, you know, particularly for that use case. And so, you know, the product that you referenced, you know, a, a tokenized money market fund, kind of the first of its kind, and really today, the only one that is fully on chain, there's no, there's no dual books and records off chain. I mean, the source of truth resides on a public blockchain and, and that's, that's what it's all about, right? And so it's incredibly impactful. I think that part is more significant than the AUM it's garnered, right? But, you know, it started off as a tokenized money market fund. 
And it was, a, it was a lengthy process, as I mentioned, you know, we started in kind of 18, 19. And so there's a couple of components to it. One, you have to figure out the technology. We decided to, because we wanted to learn it, to do it in-house, fully in-house, end-to-end. And then the second piece, you know, equally, if not more important, is, is we, did, we chose to do it as a security token, as you mentioned. And so the regulatory path to get that done was as kind of trailblazing as the technological path right, to build it. And these kind of ran in parallel and they took several years, but we're, we're really starting to get a lot of momentum with it, not just in terms of, you know, AUN, that's the easy thing to look at, but in terms of, you know, approvals. Um, Cause again, we just decided to do it all, all kind of, you know, above board, right. And, and get all the necessary approvals and cross the T's, dot the I's, all that good stuff. So, but that takes time. And so that's really, there's a lot of learnings on both sides of this fence on the technology side, for sure. But I think that's becoming more and more commoditized. I think the, the, the trickier part was figuring out the regulatory path, the right relationships, the right dialogue, the, the pain points, you know, that say the regulators have with these sorts of products that, so that expertise in, in terms of navigating that and to get it across the finish line was huge because now that we've carved out a path you know, you could imagine doing it with other, other products. Right. And so, but even with that, this first one, the tokenized money market fund, there's still a lot we can do with it and for it recently in the news or relatively recently permissions were just enabled. So this is basically a yield coin, right? It's a, it's a stable coin that earns yield, the yield backed obviously by, by treasuries and, and this money market fund. And now permissions are permissions or are, are, uh, you have permission to transfer it to other to other people right now it's just permissible for institutions but obviously you can kind of imagine where this where this might go and so you know expanding the utility and the functionality of this one product is something we're interested in as well as you know how can you apply this to other products as well yeah thank you for sharing that context there i wanted to ask a more specific question about kind of the tech stack that you decided on back when you launched this first money market fund on chain combination of like polygon and stellar chain so what have the learnings been on that? Would If you were to do it again, would it be with the same tech stack? And as you're thinking about tokenization going forward at Franklin, how are you kind of thinking about the current chain landscape for tokenization? Yeah, it's a good question. So, and, and the order was actually uh, flipped, right, from what you said. So we started on Stellar, and then since then, I've, I've added Polygon and, and announced, you know, several more chains. But, you know, starting on Stellar, I mean, one of the reasons there was, was, you know, from a cost perspective, it was, you know, quite cheap. And again, I think these use cases really only work when they're not 10% better, but they're 10x better. And so for us, you know, to run a fund, you know, on chain versus off chain, you know, we wanted to see that order of magnitude different. And a little bit too is when we got started. So as I mentioned, you know, kind of 2018, 2019, you know, also plays a, a role here. I mean, some of these chains that are, that we're now working with weren't even around back then, right? Exactly. But, but Stellar was, and, and, you know, things kind of worked and they worked in a, in a very cost of efficient way for us. And I think we had this sense, we still do that over time, a lot of the crypto components are going to be abstracted away from the user. Right. And, and it won't matter as much, you know, to maybe to the end user, what chain it's on, because again, it'll be abstracted away. It's, part of the plumbing. And so if we could facilitate the operations of it on a chain that we could, you know, rely upon that could deliver what we need in a cost-effective way, you know, that would be great. But I think fast forward, I mean, your question about, well, what learnings, you know, have you gained from this? I think, you know, you realize it's probably going to be a multi-chain world going forward. And, and so you want to have a presence on different chains and, and you want a safe way for them to be interconnected. One of the things we didn't appreciate as much back then is, is, you know, as you know, it's almost how, you know, tribal some of these chains can get. And, and when you're on their chain, all of a sudden you have this community, you know, kind of supporting your, your products and you know, a loud, you know, megaphone. And, and, and so, you know, that's not really something that went into our, our decision-making process, you know, at the time, but it's interesting to, to now look, you know, if you launch a product on a certain chain that has a really loud community. They can either, you know, be your promoters, you know, your advocates, or, you know, if they don't like what you're doing, they can be your harshest critics, but they're, you know, another kind of, you know, stakeholder that's out there. But I think, I think the big thing is, is being on multiple chains, but again, making sure the value proposition works in, in, 
And what we mean by that is if you're going to be doing lots of little transfers, it has to be cost efficient. And so that kind of played into what chains we've chosen to work with. And then they have to be reliable. And so we have a whole kind of suitability framework for how we think about what chains to build on. And then over the years, it's become quite robust. So, you know, lots of different dimensions where you can think of it, we almost, you know, score different blockchains on a, a whole variety of variables and dimensions to think about, you know, if we build on this chain, is it going to be around in X amount of years and, and are costs going down or are they going up? as that's as that chain scales so you know all these become important you want it reliable and you want it fast and you want it cheap oh yeah and, and the blockchain landscape is ever evolving we've got new projects spawning all the time both on top of ethereum but then on the monolithic options you have some pretty lucrative places to potentially uh, launch money market funds on right now so i think the important point that you alluded to there is the fact that from an end user's perspective the technicality and the tech stack is going to be abstracted so you're really, really able to maintain this really open approach in assessing which platform really suits the needs of a specific fund, for example, and, and, you know, experimenting as you go. So, so that's great to hear. And as it's pretty evident that capital markets are slowly moving on chain, what I wanted to ask a bit more of a high level question and specifically re related to your operations at Franklin is that as blockchain technology becomes more adopted, money markets move on chain and you're able to enhance operational efficiencies, at least in theory, in non-investment capacities. How are you thinking about potentially moving more of Franklin's operations on chain in general to tap into these efficiencies that being on chain comes with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this gets back into a little bit what I was saying about when we think about, you know, kind of high level with the value proposition of crypto. One is there's this cost efficiency and savings from stripping out intermediaries, decreasing the cost of trust, all of that fits into that theme, right? And so I think if you can get to the point where it's 10x better instead of 10%, you know, there's a lot you can do there. I think um, all of it requires, you know, the, the regulatory path and that sort of thing. And so, but it, I'll say it's working, right? And so we are thinking about what more we can do there. And then the other component, just not to lose sight of it is is you really want to enhance functionality and utility to not just make things cheaper, but make things better. And so with that, thinking about just in this one example, how can a money market fund on chain be better from it being on chain, not, not just cheap, cheaper. And one of the ways is by being able to use it as a kind of medium of exchange, which typically you know, isn't done as much. Usually, right, the money market fund just sits in your portfolio, you know, kind of accruing interest. But here, if instead of, you know, sending a stable coin to someone, you know, as a payment, I could send, you know, a security token that has an embedded yield component, well, and that's a really functionality and utility that's enabled with it being on chain. So a whole new use case, which is pretty interesting to think about. And so as we think about you know, on the building side of our house, what does that product roadmap look like? I think it starts with what more can we do with this one product that we have? And then, you know, to your earlier question, taking all those learnings that we developed from that one product, how can we apply that to other things? And obviously there's a lot you can do there, but you know, I think what we've learned also is, is it is still kind of baby steps and, and it's a lot of, you know, regulatory approval process, which, you know, just it takes time, but at least I think we're making progress. Yeah, you definitely are. But I think that that is important to emphasize that it is step by step, uh, because in theory, you see a lot of writing around the fact that, hey, uh, you could take a massive asset manager, move it on chain like this. But you got to emphasize the theory part because <laughs> we're definitely not there yet. But a path towards that can definitely be seen. So your approach sounds like it makes a ton of sense. But on on this topic, just finally, what kind of partnerships are you kind of working on or around to pursue kind of more integration into this on-chain environment? And what kind of role do these play in this roadmap? Yeah, it's a good question. It's certainly something that, um, you know, we think about and explore quite a bit. We have, we have one of my colleagues, you know, he kind of runs partnerships for digital assets. So he's, you know, kind of always thinking about these things. So one form of partnership is, is what chain we're building on. And so you know, obviously we, you know, you mentioned Stellar and Polygon and we've announced several others like, you know, Arbitrum and Avalanche and Aptos. 
And, you know, and then there's a whole suite of others that we're, we're talking to, you know, always having these, these conversations, this dialogue. So that's one source of kind of partner. Another is in terms of say, you know, distribution or that sort of thing. And, and we announced a, a partnership in, in the Middle East with this kind of tokenized money market, you know, fund product to kind of, you know, roll something like that out there. So, you know, that is a partnership that we've announced, I think, as we right now are in its existing form, this product was really for domestic, you know, US uh, users, but you know, what does that look like for it to be global? That's where, you know, I think some of these partnership opportunities come into play and, and the one that I alluded to there. So I think it, it's something that we certainly explore a lot. And I think there's a lot more to be done there. I think the tokenization you've also seen, you know, press in the industry for say an asset manager to partner with a tokenization platform. I think the reason why we chose to build in-house and do it kind of end to end was really one to understand it all, to deeply understand it all in a way that maybe you can only get if you, if you make some of the mistakes and kind of go through it yourself. So I think that's a big part of the reason we, why we initially built it in-house, but certainly open to that the strategic partnerships that make sense in terms of further distribution or, or new product. No, yeah, yeah. Thanks for saying that. That makes sense. Now, starting to kind of wrap this up here, I'd just be interested in learning a bit more about what you are focusing on right now in the market, because we're still at the stage where we haven't unlocked hyper growth and mass adoption. Um, we're still looking for the killer use case. We have stable coins, which are proving to be a pretty, pretty killer use case, but we still need more to attract retail users and just really start pulling in the rest of the economy on chain. So as of right now, what crypto use cases do you find most interesting or promising? Yeah, definitely. A uh, good question. I think, I think there's a lot of anticipation. <laughs> Let's let up waiting for the next kind of killer app. And I always kind of refer to, you know, cryptos, chat GPT moment, right? That's what the industry really needs. You know, that just that easy aha moment. And, you know, we did have kind of DeFi and, and NFTs and it, it's now it's been a while, right? And so people are like, w what's next? And I think to get that next really stage and leg of growth, you need new users, new capital. Obviously we've created new doors for people to come through, you know, with the ETF and whatnot, but how do you get you know, genuine users again, to the sustainability point, you really need these new use cases, these new killer apps. And so we think that we try to look at it this way of, of all the sectors and narratives, whatever you want to call it that are out there, which ones have like the highest probability of a killer app actually taking off and, and getting some escape velocity. And then you could actually do another kind of cross section or an overlay in terms of how do those fit onto which chains are out there, right? So, and a lot of this gets into why we have become, you know, quite constructive on, on Solana and we, you know, we put out a couple of pieces on that. But when you think about it, you want the largest net to be able to kind of catch the thing that takes off. We don't know exactly what it's going to be yet. One of the areas that is interesting and where it, it, you could see something really take off is in deep in, you know, so decentralized physical infrastructure networks. We like it a lot because we think there's a clear use case and value proposition there. I can tell you that prospective clients also like it because it brings it out of crypto native land and it's a real tangible use case that touches the real world. And, and when you think about what's actually happening in these projects, you're taking this new mechanism, the token, and really realizing that it's incentive mechanism that you can use to bootstrap a network and to put that into kind of TradFi speak, it's a way to crowdsource your CapEx. And so that's pretty interesting because in kind of web two land, you have these real tech incumbents that have built up considerable moats in terms of the technology and the CapEx that was used to, you know, build the, these moats and there's kind of, you know, regulatory kind of protections a lot of times around them. And, and so how do you, how do you pose a credible threat into these say oligopolies? And one way you can do so is by having a cheaper cost of capital and being able to bootstrap, you know, crowdsource your CapEx, bootstrap a network and create enough of a wedge into these kind of existing industries where you can start to pose a credible threat. So this. This could happen in, you know, decentralized, say compute or storage or bandwidth networks. You're seeing it with mapping, right? 
all different kinds of interesting kind of deep pin subsectors. The problem is, and I think you, you alluded to this earlier on in the conversation, is a lot of these are marketplaces, supply and demand. What we've seen is it's easier to use token incentives to bring up the supply side of the equation. But then equally important, you have to demonstrate demand, actual revenue generating contracts on the other side, you know, and that sort of thing for the marketplace to really take off. Another kind of tricky part is when you start to touch the real world, it's great because now I can understand it more easily than say a crypto native use case. But if it touches the real world and I have like real hardware, or if I have, you know, whether it's a dash cam or whatever, you know, or a little antenna that I'm putting in homes, now I need to actually manufacture those. I need to distribute those and I got to make sure my supply chain is working. And so the, the, you know, the negative side of dealing with the real physical world is you have real physical constraint that can kind of slow down just pure speculative kind of crypto native growth. And so, you know, all, all that being said, we think that sector has some real legs. And again, if you want the bi biggest net to try to catch the thing that takes off next, I think having some eyes and attention on, on that sector, just as an example, it is a good one. I think that is a really great example and a sector that I've been looking into as well. And I feel that as a topic, that is one where uh, I'm aware you've been writing a piece around this, hopefully as, as a bit of a sneak peek, hopefully we'll be posting it soon. I'm looking forward to reading it, but th that is a topic that, that we could even maybe hop onto a podcast and just discuss that the economics around bootstrapping a deep in network and getting that up and running because the supply demand side dynamics and balancing that out and how you manage customer acquisition and how, how you build sticky customers is there's a lot of fascinating things to speak about and a lot of novelty involved in how you bootstrap a crypto network with physical aspect in real life. So maybe that's something we should look into, but, but yeah, at this stage, I mean, this was a great discussion. I feel, I really appreciate your time, Christopher. This is insightful for a lot of people to understand how you are approaching this asset class. And I really appreciate how structured and thought out of an approach you do have and the focus on fundamentals is also re refreshing so you're doing great work i can't wait to see how everything develops and on both the tokenization side and what kind of new products you're putting out and hope we can do this again at some point thanks a lot really really appreciate it